Hello, I'm Josephine Kafanya and welcome. Our next guest is Sue Cunningham. She's a Victorian director of Red Cross Australia. She has more than 20 years of leadership experience across the health, emergency services, aged care and community sectors. Welcome, Sue, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Josephine. Great to be talking with you. Now, all that knowledge and experience in those sectors would be invaluable in this torrid COVID-19 time. But have you found that many organisations, no matter what experience, have been left wanting because of this pandemic? Uh, no, I'd actually say quite the contrary. I think um, it's an awful time um, at a global level, but I've got to say, I think so many organisations, communities, individuals are stepping up to the mark and um, it's been heartwarming to see so many people um, try and respond. I mean, it hasn't been easy and it hasn't always been successful, but I have to say one of the, the great things about this awful time is the willingness of people, organisations, communities, governments uh, to try and, and, and come together and do things to respond appropriately. So. Um, yeah, I think, to be honest, I've seen a lot of um, different ways people are, are really putting in. And given that Australia, particularly the East Coast, has just come out of the bushfires over summer, how were resources stretched because of that? Look, there's no doubt it has been a really horrid uh, 2020, particularly um, for Australia and all of those um, uh, communities and the terrible devastation they suffered. I have to say... Um, being part of the emergency services support network in Australia. Um, it was uh, obvious that the, the bushfires have um, impacted not just into the communities, of course, first and foremost, uh, but of course, into all the networks and support uh, services that, that help those communities. And I think um, it's clearly um, at one level, uh, fantastic that uh, the uh, sector was re you know, fully operational and active at the time it happened, but of course it's put an extra strain uh, on an already strained system, but uh, I think as a community we're going to need to get uh, used to having multiple and sustained emergencies of increasing duration and severity. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, we, like others in the sector, are learning about fatigue management, operational sustainability, uh, and ultimately, again, lots of opportunity to learn and practice about how we can uh, become better at being able to respond to you know, multiple needs in multiple locations. And in, when you say become better, in particular, what are you referring to? I guess I'm just very mindful um, of our change in climate, which I think um, has been recognised around the, the world um, as one of the sort of uh, challenges that humanity needs to face. Uh, and I think the reality is, uh, be it fire, be it flood, be it pandemic, uh, we are going to see um, increasing challenges like this. And I think um, we're going to all have to learn to have the flexibility and agility to respond to that, but also manage our personal energy, our organisational energy and our community energy uh, to sustain and respond to these events. So how do you do that? How do you manage uh, that, that community and volunteer operation? Yeah, well, that, it is a tough one, and I don't uh, for a minute profess to have all the answers, but I think we're certainly learning as we go. Um, there's, there's a few things we can all do. I mean, it always starts with self. Um, so um, all of us individually, we're all being personally tested um, at the moment through COVID, those of us who are fortunate enough not to be tested by the bushfires. Um, and managing your personal energy, your personal wellbeing um, is always the place to start. Start with yourself before you help others. Uh, but in doing that, in managing your own energy, your own sustainability, looking after yourself, you also have the energy to help to look after others. And, uh, you know, being that person to flag, uh, certainly within uh, Australian Red Cross, we had a lot of fatigue coming out of... Um, uh, our response mm. to the bushfires, but it wasn't just self-identifying that you needed help. It was actually looking after our peers, our colleagues, the broader Red Cross family, uh, identifying when people looked tired, needed a break, needed support, and that reaching out um, and supporting other people and, and helping them help themselves uh, if they may not be in a position for whatever reason to sort of identify where they're at. So I think if we were at that at person at, at that personal level at that individual level of helping ourselves and then others in our network actually that can actually work at a global level as well so can you recount to us when you first realize oh this is big this is coming our way and what you did immediately and then what role the red cross has had during this pandemic yeah so in terms of the pandemic um i think 
the reality was it was in early March uh, when it was starting to amplify around the world that we knew um, that we were, were facing something very serious here in Australia. Um, I think as an organisation, uh, because we had stood up, because we had been operating um, at scale uh, in a complex way, we were able to pivot very quickly um, and we'd already broken down some barriers, I think, in terms of uh, traditional thinking. We, we'd, we'd had to, to, to work at scale already. We'd had to work in a sustained way already. So actually, from that perspective, the, uh, oh, gosh, we need to look this way now, not that way. And in fact, one of our challenges was remembering that we did have um, to continue our support for all those impacted by the bushfires. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was around how do we continue to sustain our support in that space while pivoting the organisation and starting to look at what responses uh, we can provide into the community. And of course, we had to pivot ourselves as well. So it was, uh, you know, taking that ability to, to look in multiple directions at once. How do we support bushfire affected communities? How do we pivot ourselves to respond uh, to the challenges of COVID? What does that mean? Which programs and services do we have to suspend or alter? And then also, what's the humanitarian and emergency response we need to provide into the community? Uh, and like everyone else, we had to uh, work through um, some of the challenges about working out what does this mean and, and what support do we need to provide. Um, in Victoria, we're part of the emergency services sector and, and one of our uh, standing roles is to help coordinate the food and water. Um, so in, in emergency relief situations and of course in those early days of COVID as people were grabbing um, toilet paper and other staples <laughs> off the shelves, uh, the availability of food um, and water became a fairly pressing concern and uh, certainly we went um, from uh, having done a lot of food and water distribution in Victoria uh, into isolated communities to having to stand up again in partnership with Food Bank and um, other uh, partners behind the scene, um, a fairly rapid ability to mobilise um, quarantine packs and provide people with, sorry, not quarantine packs, but self-isolation packs and, and 14 days of food and water. Super difficult to do and we had to do it across Victoria um, at high demand and short notice and uh, that certainly put our team under pressure and working in partnership with lots of others um, we were able to do that but you know the reality of um, this is important people are self-isolating and of course a very fundamental human need of food and water mm -hmm. uh, and the anxiety that causes people uh, if that's not something that's immediately available to them and, and particularly the more vulnerable in our community who of course um, are not well positioned uh, to be able to um, help themselves sometimes in these sort of situations. So I think having to stand up that food and water distribution system um, at short notice and in such a comprehensive manner was um, probably one of the sort of biggest changes we had to make in those early days to respond to the need as it was emerging. How many of those packs did you supply? Uh, I think we supplied well over a thousand um, of those packs. Um, in, in, uh, I remember one early weekend, uh, we were working with our partners, including Australia Post and Victoria Freight Services to do the distribution of those food packs. Uh, and at short notice on a Friday afternoon, um, there was um, issues with uh, them being able to provide that service. So we actually did a call out for volunteers. We called out to our staff, we called out to a volunteer base. Um, amazingly, this was three o'clock on Friday and, and really concerned about getting food and water to people um, over the weekend. We had um, amazingly 90 volunteers turn up at the food bank warehouse on Saturday morning. And they, in that day alone, drove close to 200 packs all around the state just to make sure that people did have those supplies. And of course, the relief for people uh, when that box appeared um, mm. was um, certainly gratifying for all the people who, who made such an amazing effort. Well, let's turn to the role of the volunteer. Has there been a shortage or as you've just indicated, all you have to do is put out the call and more people do put their hand up? Look, I think to be honest, we've been overwhelmed both in the bushfires and in COVID with how, how generous people are. Um, and we've certainly been in a lucky position as an organisation that we've um, had lots of people express interest in volunteering. Um, absolutely, there have been a number of our volunteers who have not been able to continue to volunteer, which of course is often um, uh, a big disappointment to themselves. But uh, one of our programs, for example, our patient transport service, where we drive uh, people around the state for medical appointments, 94% um, of those volunteers, an amazing group of over 300 people around the state, were over 65 and therefore in the age group of uh, mm. being particularly vulnerable to COVID. Uh, so we did actually have to take um, a difficult decision from my perspective to uh, stand those volunteers down um, in those early days because we were very concerned about the exposure and whether we could provide a safe environment for them, uh, particularly as they're connecting into the health sector. Um, and uh, we um, 
um, we put out the call for other volunteers to get people who are less vulnerable. And it was fantastic to work with Volunteering Victoria and a whole lot of other volunteering organisations to source a new volunteer workforce over a period of a week or two and uh, to stand up 17 new volunteers. So in some instances, we've had uh, volunteers that have needed to stand aside, but on the other end of the spectrum, we've absolutely had um, organisations, individuals reach out to us and, and want to help. Um, so uh, on, on balance, uh, we've certainly been lucky enough to be able to connect with people when, when we've needed to. And have you, have you found that there's been a change in that attitude, particularly this year, given the bushfires and then the pandemic, that, first of all, the attitude toward volunteers, because quite often volunteers feel uh, undervalued, but also the fact that more want to. I mean, what, what, what differences have you noticed this year? Uh, we've certainly noticed um, an increase in people's willingness to volunteer. I think people, uh, particularly uh, when we kicked off with the bushfires, people were, were horrified and, and, you know, really, really mm. wanted to reach out. And, and, and some did that amazingly through the generosity of donations, but so many others uh, were generous enough to offer their time. So we had so many people, um, uh, thousands of offers of, of volunteering support in those um, early uh, months of the year and we've certainly as I said even through through COVID we've uh, recently launched a COVID connect service which is you know a phone call from a Red Cross volunteer made from someone's home to connect with someone who's socially um, isolated or lonely uh, and we've, we've stood up that service from scratch over the last uh, three or four weeks uh, at a national level and and again we've put the call out for volunteers and and people are people are willing to help so many people mm. want to help they're 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 worried about what's happening in the world and they and they have uh, the means and the generosity to offer their time um, and and their kindness so um, yeah we've certainly been fortunate to to receive that and what's the most common comment you've had from particularly volunteers first time volunteers what do they say to you most of them are beautiful. Uh, I think we're like any organisation in that um, we can't always uh, offer um, a fantastic volunteering experience. Sometimes when we onboard people, uh, there's a gap between onboarding them and, and getting them involved. Uh, but on, on the main, um, we've had some beautiful um, expressions of people just being so happy they can help, really, really appreciative they can contribute. Uh, we recently uh, stood up a call of volunteers to help um, start thinking about our changing climate and how to address that. And we've been overwhelmed again. This was pre-Christmas, actually. And we mm. had 136 people apply in under two weeks uh, to just be part of a, a pool that we were creating. And uh, uh, people with all sorts of skills and experience are offering really amazing um, backgrounds. Um, and they're just wrapped. You know, one, one recent comment was around, I can't believe I get to do my master's and help design programs for the Red Cross. So, you know, they're just wrapped to be involved. They appreciate the opportunity. Uh, everyone, doesn't matter what their background is, whether they're completing a master's, whether they're, um, you know, 17 and living alone, everyone brings their life experiences to the volunteer mm. experience. And, and most of the time, it's really that um, gratitude and appreciation uh, to be able to help others. Um, and of course, also share and connect. Volunteers often love um, the sense of community that comes from, uh, you know, being part of a, a broader group and a broader, broader cause. And do you think there's a greater sense of social conscience as a result of these crises? Um, I don't know if it's a greater sense, perhaps, or perhaps it's just that our environment is pulling out. Um, or, or tapping into that. Um, there's certainly been some discussion in, in recent years about perhaps young people aren't as interested in volunteering these days. But uh, when we did a survey in 2018 about are young people interested in volunteering, the resounding answer was yes. They needed the mode and method of volunteering to change. They wanted to get involved in short-term projects, um, projects that had social impact that could develop their skills. Um, so I think the need has always been there, but I think what we're seeing at the moment um, is an environment uh, where, for a whole variety of different circumstances, people, um, you know, the reality is with COVID Connect, some people have more time on their hands than they've had in the past, others less so. Mm. Uh, but I, I think, to be honest, um, uh, and we've done kindness surveys uh, year in, year out that shows that people want to be kind and they want to connect and they, they, they appreciate acts of kindness. I think, um, unfortunately, 2020 has brought out um, a lot of opportunity um, to draw into mm. that social um, connection and that willingness um, or that interest to be kind. And what aspect, we've seen a lot of change happening, people doing things differently and being forced to do things differently. For example, this interview that we're doing, but what aspects 
new aspects of, of operating have emerged during this pandemic that you'd like to see permanently adopted? Well, I think, um, and I'm sure this is a, a comment that many would make, we've all experienced the flexibility of um, essentially working from home and working in different contexts. Um, and whilst that brings an awful lot of challenges, I think it has shown us that things can be done in different ways and, and with more flexibility. Um, so I think, um, generally speaking, there has been a willingness to try new things um, and to not get caught up in traditional um, worries or silos or bureaucracies. And I, I think that attitude, that, that flexible attitude uh, would be fantastic if we could preserve that moving forward. So uh, often when people try new things and I think it's hard even, oh, can I do an interview from my, my home? You know, yeah. they do it and then they find they can do it and it gives them confidence. So I think it's not just that ability to be more flexible now, but that mindset that goes with it uh, to try new things, to find out that it's okay and that different things can be tackled in a different way. And uh, imagine the power of that. Imagine if we could as a community harness that willingness to try new things and, and get that to um, continue beyond COVID. Imagine um, the amazing things that we could all collectively achieve. Mm. And how have volunteers coped with being able to keep in touch with those people suffering loneliness, particularly the elderly who are being forced to isolate much more than, than the general uh, younger community. How are you doing things differently? How are you keeping in touch with those isolated people while keeping volunteers safe at the same time? Yeah, so a couple of things there. Obviously, for our own volunteers, we've had to, um, in a couple of cases, um, as I mentioned before, stand them down or, or they're unable to continue with the work mm. we've done. So uh, we've sort of used the Red Cross family to continue to connect with them. So uh, next week, of course, National uh, This Week Volunteering Week is all around looking about how can we celebrate and connect with volunteers. And so it is about making phone calls out and we'll be making phone calls out to, to everyone to try and connect with them and, and, and say hello. So... Uh, we do that anyway. Phone call's quite not the same, is it, though? No, the phone call's not, the, not same. the same as knocking a knock on the door and, no. you know, checking on someone. But no. it's it's limited to that. And also the elderly don't don't have, a lot of them don't know how to use an iPad or, or a, you know, a laptop. So, again, that not being able to see someone, look someone and have a conversation face-to-face. Yeah, absolutely. But if nothing else, um, uh, we're using this opportunity to try and include um, that digital connection. And, and there's no doubt the digital divide is perhaps growing at this point through COVID. More and more people are connecting online, but the ones that can't are becoming more and more excluded. Uh, but the incentive to get online has perhaps never been stronger or the need. Yeah. Uh, so in some cases, we're reaching out to people and actually just working with them to help them have their uh, fantastic the other day uh, to work with um, uh, the chairman of our, our, our advisory board, a, a member of 52 years, who, who's, who did her first Skype call um, a couple of weeks ago and was absolutely beaming to be on the first Skype call and lovely to be seeing her face after having been on the phone with her for a few months. So we are trying to connect in with people and particularly elderly people and support them to get online when they can. Uh, but the reality is uh, we can't always do that. And I think um, that's, yeah, we have to work within the constraints of of how we're all operating at the moment. Mm. Could, it, could it be that post-COVID, uh, a lot of the elderly uh, in the community are given training lessons for, you know, or, or iPads to help them, but also help your organisation uh, keep in touch? Yeah, we're certainly starting to investigate that. It's becoming really clear um, to us that, um, and one of the things we always like to do at Red Cross is try and prepare for emergencies. And so whether it's for um, bushfires, whether it's for COVID, whether it's for, you know, the next emergency down the road, um, how can you be prepared for an emergency if you're actually not connected online, if you're not accessing information, if you can't connect remotely? So I think the need um, to increase uh, our support um, to, to people from that digital perspective is growing and we're certainly looking at ways that we can both during COVID and I agree with you post COVID um, increase that digital connection um, I think that's going to be really an important thing that mm. ourselves and many other organisations are going to need to look look at how we can improve on that and tell me about your role with the returning travellers who those who are forced into quarantine for 14 days have you had a role there 
Um, across Australia, we certainly have. So in a lot of states and territories, we're connecting directly uh, with those that are in hotel quarantine. Uh, we're doing things like developing quarantine kits, so trying to uh, provide a bit of a toolkit for those that are stuck in um, quarantine and, and working through um, how to look after, you know, simple exercises you can do in a hotel room, how you can look after your mental health, um, how you can manage some tips and tricks if you've got kids, et cetera, in the room with you. Um, here in Victoria, we're um, sitting behind the um, government Victoria COVID hotline and for people who call that, um, there's all sorts of um, uh, services available to people uh, through that line, but it includes ourselves and the Victorian Council of Churches providing some psychosocial first aid. Uh, so we're certainly available at the end of a, a phone line as well to connect with people who, um, who are looking to have a bit of a chat uh, mm. to support their wellbeing. Now, we've talked about attitudes to, to volunteers. What about community attitudes toward their neighbours? You, you know, that, that looking out for people. Do you see that's changed this year in particular? Oh, absolutely. We've heard lots of beautiful stories at work uh, just from people sharing what's happening in their own neighbourhood and, and neighbours meeting for the first time. Uh, little notes appearing in letterboxes. Um, some of our members are actively out and about supporting others in the community who may not be able to get out for shopping or things like that. So uh, I think lots of people have heard stories um, about neighbours, connecting with neighbours. And, and one of the amazing things about that, of course, is once you've met and connected with your neighbour, then um, hopefully that relationship continues post-COVID. Mm. Uh, mm. So absolutely. Now, back to the issue of, of, of volunteers. In Given that the call for volunteers, as you say, is probably going to increase in future. Do you think that some sort of remuneration, perhaps small, but should be considered? And would that attract more or would that at least make the volunteer feel more appreciated, feel that, that their efforts are being appreciated? What's your view on that? Well, certainly the research we've done certainly suggests that that's not a form of appreciation that they value. Um, People tend to volunteer often for altruistic purposes because they generally want to help others or because of things uh, such as having better social connections. So often um, for a whole variety of different reasons, but it's you know usually obviously of course not for sort of reward. And uh, we try and show our appreciation for volunteers in a whole range of different ways. Um, last Friday was actually uh, World Red Cross Day um, and we have a range of Red Cross awards, for example, which is one of the way we try and show our appreciation um, of some of our many amazing volunteers. So um, in our experience, and, and when we ask our volunteers about, about that, A, they tend not to want appreciation. A lot of them are incredibly modest given the amazing contributions they make. Uh, and secondly, um, you know, the best form of appreciation is always that personal, um, the, the thank you, the phone call, the certificate, um, you know, that uh, it's sometimes that public recognition is also really uh, valued. But um, for, for my mind personally, uh, I, I'm not sure that um, remuneration of volunteers is um, something that, yeah, we'd be, we'd be looking at or interested in. And what about the demographic uh, of those volunteers that, that you have? Would you like to see an increase in any particular age group uh, or wanting in an age group? Um, look, I think uh, any organisation should always look to be representative of their community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say at this stage, we have not achieved that. Uh, we are getting better at it. 77%, uh, um, around 70%, sorry, of our volunteers are female, but that varies according to the type of volunteering role. So, you know, 64% of our emergency services volunteers are female. So we like to be representative across all facets, whether it's gender, whether it's age, whether it's um, ethnic backgrounds. Um, and I do think we've got more work to do there, but we have been active um, in that space. We're certainly seeing young volunteers being attracted. In fact, our entire Victorian social media team, there's eight or nine really talented and gifted people uh, who do all sorts of amazing things with our Facebook and Instagram page. Uh, a lot of our justice volunteers, interestingly, are under 30. So I think different people, quite rightly, should, should volunteer with an organisation that they sort of connect with and believe with, and of course, a cause that, you know, interests or inspires them. So I think the job of Red Cross and all other volunteering organisations is to make sure we're as inclusive as possible, that we reach out and connect with those groups in the community and then, of course, uh, and make sure we're accessible. And, and I think we've got more work to do there um, because, you know, Victoria is a very diverse and multicultural mm. society and I don't think um, we're uh, anywhere near where we need to be in terms of that representative, but we're on the journey to get there. Um, so, so not, not um, to answer your question, 
I want us to be more reflective of society. I think we're well on the way to doing that, uh, but we've got more work to go. And how do you attract more men? I'm quite surprised at that very low figure for, for male representation. Well, actually, that's relatively common um, for uh, women to volunteer uh, more than men. So uh, we'd be representative, I'd imagine, of um, other volunteering organisations. Yes. Um, I think there's a variety of causes that contribute to that. Um, sometimes it's essentially the um, partly reflective of the gender imbalance in terms of working environments, and sometimes essentially, you know, mums at homes with kids or um, older women may have the capacity that, that men don't, I think. So there is a structural element to it. But I think there's also um, making sure that we provide our volunteering opportunities that, again, um, interest and engage um, men and are appropriate um, to their interests. You know, emergency services is the area where we probably do have the most um, men connected in as a programmatic approach to volunteering. Um, and, you know, again, that might be a little bit reflective of, of the nature of some of the, the, the experiences people have there. Our patient transport drivers, we have significant um, men involved in that because uh, men quite like to drive cars, I've found, or that, or that seems to be what's <laughs> indicated by our patient transport team. So, you know, it's about providing volunteer opportunities that attract our people as people and their particular interests. But have you ever put out, specifically put out the call for male volunteers? Because... Perhaps the general population doesn't realise that not enough men volunteer. Uh, look, I'm not sure that we have, so I might have to take that um, that suggestion up, Josephine. Mm. That's a good one. All right, look, I know you're very busy and we really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us with your insights and uh, thank you for your efforts and for your organisation's efforts. I don't know what we do without you. Um, I appreciate it and good luck for the, for the rest of the year. Yeah, fantastic, Josephine. Thank you. It's been great Thank to you. talk. Cheers.